This episode brought to you by Stamps.com. Why go to the store to get stamps when you can have them printed right at home for your convenience? Ladies and gentlemen, behold the outcast, the creepy and depraved, the bizarre creations not meant for the normal world. Embrace the twisted weirdness of Freak Show Cinema! Margot Robbie has had the best and worst luck playing the iconic character Harley Quinn. I argue there's far more pros than cons, especially when you consider in DC's lineup, actors have been switched out to play famous characters, and she stayed the same the whole time. I think that shows how much people are now cementing her with the character. But there certainly are some cons. For example, Suicide Squad was a huge hit at the box office, but both critics and audiences seem to hate it. Its follow-up, THE Suicide Squad, I guess THE is code for sorry, we'll try again, was a hit with critics and audiences, but nobody went to see it. And then you have this little movie, which critics kinda liked and audiences kinda liked, but once again, nobody saw it. And I hate to say it, but it's hard not to see why. Nobody really knew what this movie was supposed to be. This is just at the point where DC was getting more experimental with their movies, and in some respects, this tried the most different things. Say what you will about Suicide Squad, but it knew how to advertise itself. A bunch of villains forced to do good things, but doing it in their own bad way. It made no sense in the context of the film, but from an advertising standpoint, that sounds like a lot of fun. This is... A Birds of Prey movie, we think? With Harley Quinn, we think, even though she's in most of the advertising in the majority of the film? She's being bad, maybe? And the Birds of Prey are being good, perhaps? Are they even heroes? I think I saw a shitty show about them once and I remember them being heroes. It's a superhero movie, but about a supervillain who doesn't do supervillain stuff. It's more of a heist comedy, except when we focus on superheroes who sometimes do superhero stuff. <laughs> Yeah, the advertising for this movie was pretty poorly handled. How poorly handled was it? Honestly, I'm still not sure what the title is. Originally, it was Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. Then they panicked at people's confusion and retitled it Harley Quinn Birds of Prey, which in some ways makes less sense. Is she supposed to be one of the Birds of Prey? Then they changed it back to the original title because the film bombed and fuck it, who cares anymore? So it's no wonder this film had such a tough time finding an audience. Truth be told, I was one of those critics who didn't know exactly what to think about it. I guess it was okay at the time, though there clearly were a ton of problems with it. Part of that though was, I wasn't clear what to accept it as. A Birds of Prey movie, a Harley Quinn movie, a DCEU movie, a standalone movie. But I will admit, going back to watch it again, knowing now what I didn't know then, I did have a lot of fun. Some of the weaknesses of the film I now see as strengths when you accept this as a scatterbrained movie that sometimes hits bullseye, sometimes completely misses the board, but the darts are always thrown in an inventively bizarre way. This movie is like a cheese it cake. Some things work about it, some things don't, but you're still happy someone was crazy enough to make it. Truth be told, when you hear what the plot of the movie is, you do understand more why the advertising was so difficult. It focuses, for the most part, on Harley Quinn being tossed out by the Joker. Yes, I do like the emancipation is not exactly by her choice. Regardless, she declares herself her own woman not needing Mr. J anymore, which means all the gangsters who hate the shit out of her, which is understandably many, see it as open season on this pain in the ass. Without the Joker's protection, suddenly everyone with a weapon is out for her. This alone is pretty funny. Not only does it show how much she pissed them off as the first thing every mobster wants to do is kill her like they put everything else on hold, but it also shows how brain dead she is about how many friends she truly has. Seeing her scramble and remember all the dirtbag things she's done to a lot of these people and realize the only reason they were nice to her was because of the Joker makes for some great comedy. That's only part of the story though. There's a big search for a MacGuffin diamond. Yeah, this is also a little Pink Panther meets Snatch that holds a gateway to unspeakable wealth. It keeps getting tossed around though between Officer Rene Montoya, played by Rosie Perez, The Huntress, played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and Black Canary, played by Journey Smollett. Wait, as a Chicago and that name rings a bell. Oh, of course, Full House. And when I say it keeps getting tossed around, I really mean she keeps getting tossed around. For a little pickpocket named Cassandra Kane, played by Ella J. Bosco, Wait a minute, that name also rings a bell. That episode of Veep, of course, steals the diamond and swallows it once she gets caught. 
they're all being hunted down by a mob boss named Black Mask, who does sometimes wear a black mask. He has a little like Lex Luthor being bald in Superman 1. There must have been some behind the scenes stuff we didn't know about. And if this all sounds confusing, it's sometimes intentional. Upon first viewing, it can get pretty frustrating, but when you watch it again knowing where it's all gonna go, it does grow a little bit of a charm for just how random it is. It's hard to explain, but there's something enjoyably frustrating about it. Though it does make the film choppy, there is something refreshing not always remembering what happens in what order. It's not a film where I shout, oh my god, this is so forgettable, I don't even remember this scene. It's more, oh, that happened here? I thought it was later in the film. As someone who sees a lot of movies, there is something nice about having that spontaneity, yet I still remember what happens in each scene. And it does match Quinn's personality as the narrator. But like I said, it doesn't always work. Black Canary's powers don't really come into play until the last third, and I'm not sure I followed why. At the end, when they try to show the birds of prey together, I wasn't really excited to see more of them because the main focus was still Harley. There wasn't quite enough focus on them to convince me they deserve a solo movie. Which with these titles, that's clearly not what this was. And then there's... this weirdness. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. I get the feeling this made more sense in the head of the writer or the director. Like, maybe this was supposed to be the pink elephants or dude dream sequence that's just odd for the sake of being odd. But it never quite fit naturally into the movie. In fact, it feels really trimmed down, and this did not look like a cheap scene to shoot. It's just there, and then it's gone. But then there's scenes I didn't laugh that much the first time, but seeing it again, they kind of crack me up for how random they are. In the first third, Harley is obsessed with having this egg sandwich. Even when people are shooting at her, her big concern is getting a bite of this thing. We're gonna get through this, okay? The first time I saw this, I didn't think it was funny enough to dedicate so much attention to, but combined with every other strange tidbit, it does bizarrely work. She literally has no friends, and the world is trying to kill her, so her closest companion is her breakfast. It's pretty hilarious that this is the only friend she's got. But wait a minute, this is freak show cinema. Is this really as twisted and weird as it gets? Join me back after this commercial. Behold the king of stamps. Go on, behold. Uh, I bring you stamps from stamps.com. If you're a small business owner, you're busy enough as it is. You don't have time to deal with the hassle of going to the post office. At Stamps.com, you can skip the trip and never waste another dollar or minute. Stamps.com lets you print official postage right from your computer, so you can spend less time at the post office and more time running your business. The King of Stamps personally enjoys it because it saves so much time and money. Time and money I can use making the stamp crown. I steal this from an evil wizard? It also saves you stress. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Stamps.com gives you access to all the post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer. And get discounts you can't find anywhere else, like up to 40% off USPS rates and 76% off UPS. Onward, my stamp minions! They look like stamps. Whether you're in office sending invoices, a side hustle Etsy shop, or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. All you need is your computer and standard printer. No special supplies or equipment. You're up and running in minutes, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send. I knight you, Stamps.com user. Sir, Stamps.com user knight. Save time and money this year with Stamps.com. In fact, you can sign up at Stamps.com slash nostalgia for a special offer that includes a four-week free trial, free postage, and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com slash nostalgia for your special offer that includes a four-week free trial, free postage, and a digital scale. The king of Stamps has spoken! The Stamps.com king, whatever I said my name was, I am he! Away ye though thou! This thing doesn't need tricks. You know, he's spinning around, actually goes around. Like, that's kind of neat. They, they didn't need to do that. They, they did that. Stamps! Go now! So I'll just say what everyone else is thinking, or should be thinking upon seeing this. Ewan McGregor should have played the Joker. I'll be honest, I don't know much about the comic book villain Black Mask, so I can't say whether or not this is a good portrayal of him. But what I can say is this character in the movie is funny, threatening, and downright terrifying. One minute he can be bragging about some lame work of art he's got, the next he's literally peeling a family's faces off. Even then, he can show mercy to one of them, but then he sees a snot bubble from her crying. Is that a snot bubble? Ew. Gross. Oh, I've changed my mind. Peel it off. No! Fuck. 
Maybe the most uncomfortable moment doesn't even involve any violence. He just doesn't like this one woman's lap, and so he forces her to stand in front of his club and dance. He even has her boyfriend rip off her dress while she keeps dancing. Beautiful. <laughs> it's both a little funny, but super disturbing at the same time. Also, in so many movies, a person's original accent slipping through can be distracting, but McGregor's half-American, half-English accent strangely adds to his almost dual personality. Why doesn't this crossbow guy know that? You know that. I know it. Why don't I own the crossbow guy? You should own it. I mean, I like crossbows. Sometimes he's a goofball, like a fun guy you like to be in the same room with, but in a millisecond, he can turn into the last person you'll ever see in your life. And then I'm gonna peel off that pretty face and pickle it. Okay? When he needs to be funny, he's legit funny. When he needs to be scary, he's legit scary. You would betray me, would you? I was just gonna go look for the girl. Oh, no, 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 I want you to stay here with me. I want you to stay here with me close. If this was the Joker we got in Suicide Squad, I think we would have gotten a lot more movies focusing on Harley and his relationship. Whoa, wait. What? Don't kill me. Ha, ah, right. Even with such big personalities as the antagonist and protagonist, though, the film does still give attention to its title-ish characters. It's nice not only seeing some love given to Renee Montoya in a DC movie, but also Rosie Perez. For a while, she was seen as a comedic loudmouth through most of the 90s, but I remember seeing her in some really dramatic work and knew she could pull off some decent performances. I think she really nails Montoya as an older, yet still badass cop but also giving into her corny side with her forced one-liners. Holly Quinn just called open season on herself. Black Canary is also pretty good, trying to play both sides in order to get what she's truly looking for. And Huntress has a good backstory, but she's introduced a little too late to give her much of a character. Her only personality traits is that she wants revenge and doesn't know what to call herself. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? I guess that's not bad, but it doesn't really stand out either. The same can be said a little bit for Cassandra. Both these parts are acted well, but the script doesn't give them a ton to go off of. I like them fine, but if I was just to read their dialogue, I wouldn't know too much about their personalities. Just what they want and how they're getting it. Which is important, but it's not the complete package. I mean, I guess one day Cassandra Kane becomes Batgirl. Shit, I want future Batgirl to be as developed as Montoya is. But with the movie already juggling so much, it's not surprising some characters had to get cut down. I was actually shocked to discover this movie's not even two hours long. It's an hour 48. Good God, they squeezed a lot into this for that amount of time. And even with so much thrown in, the film visually still looks pretty badass. Everything from the club to the abandoned fun house to even the end credits has a grotesque, surreal, twisted look that again feeds into the dark spontaneity of its main lead and main villain. The movie looks really friggin' awesome and has no problem being loud and colorful, but also sick and gray a moment later, or even both at the same time. The action in this movie is also creatively wild. If you were to ask me where the fight scenes in Batman v Superman took place, I'd say, I don't know, abandoned buildings, abandoned buildings, and some not abandoned buildings. They're all forgettable. Here, I remember the break into the police station, the fight in the evidence locker, the climax in the fun house, the chase at the marketplace, the car chase on rollerblades. These aren't groundbreaking fights or anything, but they're all thinking a little outside the box. They're not trying to be epic and huge, they're just weird and fun, but also clearly putting a lot of thought into their choreography. It should also be pointed out that in the DCEU, this is the first R rating. With that said, the movie is smart enough to know how to use it. In that face peeling scene, it would have been really easy to go over the top with the gore, but I think just putting the knife to the throat and showing the peeled face is all you need. If it did more, it would have taken away from McGregor's performance, which is what's the most terrifying about this scene. A lot of people have said it was probably rated this way to cash in on the success of Deadpool. And while that wouldn't be the first thing that pops in my head, it wouldn't surprise me either. Even the comedic scatterbrain narration has a little bit of that feel. But I really don't think this is just a female version of Deadpool. It really is a Harley Quinn plus friends movie. Honestly, as much as I and a lot of our people have picked on the DCEU, there are several things they've done before the MCU. They got a female-led superhero movie first, they got a film about the villains first, they swallowed their pride and did a take two of a giant movie first, 
And while yes, a part of me does want to see a movie where more of Harley's tragic side is addressed, I'm not sure that's where we're at with this character right now. People forget she's only had three movies, and only once has she been the main character. And even that's debatable. For her second film in the spotlight, I think it makes sense just to have her in a crazy-ass scenario because that's what drew us to her in the first place. Especially after seeing her in Suicide Squad, a film that a lot of people didn't like, I think it is important for people to know this character can hold her own flick. On that point, I will admit, I don't think this movie's for everyone. Some people just can't get into Harley Quinn, and some of the randomness in tone, pacing, and humor can throw a lot of folks off. But I will say if you saw this movie like I did and it didn't particularly grab you, give it another shot. It doesn't get deeper or have any secret meanings, it's quite the opposite. It gets a little weirder, crazier, and even dumber. But in a way I think that's mostly intentional. If you go in aware what you're going to get and you just enjoy the insanity of it, you might have a twisted, mean-spirited good time. I don't want to say this is a turn-your-brain-off movie because that's usually the excuse actors give when they know they're promoting shit, but it is one that gets better if you watch it in an odd mood. If you do so, it's surprisingly enjoyable how all over the place it is, how disturbingly harsh it can get, yet still how little it all adds up to. It doesn't quite add to nothing to think about, like I said, it's not Big Lebowski, but it still adds up to very little, and again, I think that's intentional. If you're ever on the cusp of being ready to laugh, but also ready to punch the world in its idiot face, this weirdly might be the film to check out. Give it a watch and see all the what the fuckness you've been missing out on. I'm a nostalgia critic, I remember, so you don't have to. Why don't I own the crossbow guy? You should own it. I mean, I like crossbows. Hey, Doug Walker here doing a charity shout out and this week. It was a, another recommendation, so thank you so much for that. This is the uh, Double H Ranch. And the mission of the Double H Ranch is to provide specialized programs and year-round support for children and their families dealing with life-threatening illnesses. Their purpose is to enrich their lives and provide camp experiences that are memorable, exciting, fun, empowering, physically safe, and medically sound. All programs are free of charge. Since 1993, it has served over 60,000 children dealing with life-threatening illnesses from around the world. It was the second hole-in-the-wall camp in what has become a worldwide network of not-for-profit recreational and therapeutic experiences for children with serious illnesses. So as you can see, this is a very good organization doing some really good work. If you can donate to it, fantastic. If you're not able to, just spread the word. As always, there's so many people doing so many good things, and the more attention we can get on, the better, man. So uh, that's about it. Please check them out, and I'll see you next time. Take care.